Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast. I'm your host, Aristide, from Metabolism of Cities. And in this podcast, we interview researchers, thinkers, policymakers, and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our cities and how to reduce their environmental impacts in a socially just and context-specific way. On today's episode, I am very fortunate to receive one of the researchers that has helped laying the foundation for most of my colleagues uh, and people we have received on this podcast work, as well as mine. Uh, he has co-developed uh, and used two essential analogies uh, that uh, are essential for many concepts that we see today, which are, let's say, post-growth, degrowth, circular economy. And these analogies are mainly uh, steady-state economics and ecological economics. My guest today is Herman Delgi, which is a emeritus professor at the University of Maryland. He was a senior uh, economist at the World Bank for six years, and we'll spend a minute to discuss about that. Um, and he was the, the, the author of Steady State Economics, but also the editor of the all-star anthology towards a steady state ec economy with uh, uh, all-star um, authors such as Georgescu Rogan, Balding, Schumacher, Meadows, and so many others. Um, he is also the co-founder of uh, the academic journal Ecological Economics, and he has received countless awards that I, I, sh I cannot list them all here because there are just too many. So with all that being said, uh, welcome, Herman, to, to this uh, podcast, and thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you, Aristide. It's good to be with you. <laughs> How, um, it, of course, everybody knows you, so perhaps I'll just change this question to how do you generally present yourself to, to colleagues or to a conference? Uh, well, I suppose I'm known mainly as an ecological economist or somebody who, who's worked in steady state economics. But I, I feel, in, uh, to be fair and honest, I have to say that I started out life as a neoclassical growth economist. Uh, that, that was uh, So I had to change my mind. Um, and uh, so I tell them, you know, uh, that uh, my original idea was uh, I would like to increase, I was, was to fight poverty through economics and economic efficiency. And um, that, uh, and it was only gradually that I became dissatisfied with what I'd learned in uh, ecological economics. What uh, what I I mean with what I learned in standard neoclassical economics, uh, where did that dissatisfaction come from? I suppose it came partly from, uh, well, largely from being a student of Nicholas Georgescu Rogan, <laughs> who had also uh, made a break with standard neoclassical economics. It came also from uh, reading Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, which opened my eyes to many interrelations between the economy and the natural ecosystem. And it also came from um, teaching economics in Northeast Brazil, which is uh, sort of the poorest region of the Western hemisphere and uh, witnessing their problems of population growth and resource uh, an environmental balance, and uh, and the and the fact that economics really had very little to say about those things. Oh, uh, I'll add one more thing about <laughs> introducing myself. When um, as an undergraduate, I uh, I liked humanities and ethics and philosophy, and I liked science. And like many young under many practically all undergraduates, I had to choose a major. You know, which way was I going to go? I couldn't do both. So I didn't. Um, I didn't really want to give up either one, either the humanities <laughs> or sciences. And it seemed to me then that the social sciences were in between, and I could keep both to some degree. And the economics looked like the uh, most useful. <laughs> to me at least, of the social scientist. So I chose economics because I thought it had one foot in the world of philosophy and ethics and the other foot in the world of science and biology and physics. 
Well, that turned out to be wrong. That was a mistake. Uh, as I went on with <laughs> economics, I found out that it had both feet in the air. I mean, it, it, there was, and so that became sort of my, correcting my sophomore error was a sort sort of became my life's work over a period of time. It seems that this critique uh, exists still today. So even young undergraduates or postgraduates of economics still are dissatisfied with these, with very similar actually critiques of uh, neoclassical economics. Uh, and from what I read and 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 saw, one of your initial published work where you said you were trying to fight poverty in some context. I think at the very beginning you worked on on Mexico and even the Uruguayan economy, and I can imagine that you saw perhaps a economy as a way, as an activist, uh, perhaps as an activist movement or a way to 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 yourself be an agent into uh, alleviating poverty uh, at poverty first and then environmental degradation. Or uh, yes, that's exactly true. I. Uh... I, I was looking for a way to be useful in the world. And it seemed to me that <clears throat> uh, growing up in Texas and having some familiarity with Mexico and Latin America, I, I saw poverty there and, of course, in Texas, too. And I thought, well, it would be a good thing to... Uh, economics is supposed to be about wealth and the distribution of wealth. And that would be a good subject to uh, to help me fulfill some my little uh, hope for a role in the in the world, and uh, so that's what led me into into it and connected me with uh, to begin with with Latin America. Yes. So, so you said just before you always had this desire to to see many topics or many disciplines at the same time and you had to choose economy although one of your very early articles uh, the on economics as a life science you already seem to bridge uh, life sciences and uh, social sciences and economic sciences and uh, from what i read in the in the book of tim jackson you were somewhere in brazil when you handed in the where you mailed actually the 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 first draft to the the journal of political economy um, and it was published more or less at the same time as the speech of Robert Kennedy on, on post-growth and on the, the criticism of, of growth back in the day. Um, so, he, and if I understand well, one of the, the, the people that also inspired um, um, Robert Kennedy was uh, Rachel, uh, Rachel Carson, uh, Galbraith, and, and these elements. Did you see, was there a, such a, a small movement or was there like a, an exciting time, a, a short period of time where post-growth was actually even in politics uh, and, and that pushed you more or less to, to write this, uh, this article? Well, uh, I think so, yes. Um, I, I wrote, I started out writing that article. I, just, I had just been interested in biology for a long time and it seemed to me that Uh, as we might talk about later, there, there are many parallel ideas in economics, and, and they're both fundamentally deal with a life science, with life, the life process, the within skin life process for biology, the outside skin life process for ecology and the relation. So that that idea was what I tried to to flesh out. Um, Just as an aside, writing that article when I was teaching in Northeast Brazil, you know, I, I guess I have to explain to people, this was back in 60, 66, 67. At that time, uh, that was before computers. And when you wrote things, you wrote them out longhand. And before you submitted them, you had to get them typed and sent in. So that was a bit of a problem. Uh, there in Northeast Brazil because I was writing in English and none of the secretaries uh, knew English. And so they, but, but they were very, you know, they tried and they gave me a manuscript, tried to copy it and I had to go through it, make hand copy. So it was, I submitted something which was a, a bit messy. And, um, and it was actually, uh, to my surprise, accepted. And so that was good. And I remember the, uh, 
the editor at the time told me that uh, one of the main referees was uh, Frank Knight, a very famous economist. And, uh, and his comment was, um, I don't think it would disgrace the JPE to publish this. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's quite a compliment, I can imagine. <laughs> but, but there was something else in your question that I think I forgot. Yeah, it was a bit, um, it must have been, quite um quite exciting to live in, in this oh. tiny sliver of time <clears throat> yes. where even in politics uh, post growth was actually yeah. that's right that's right this was the time in which number one i could publish in the jp i can't publish there anymore <laughs> also i could publish in 73 in the american economic review can't do that anymore And in the University of Chicago's journal, Economic Development and Cultural Change, I could publish there. That I don't think would work anymore. So there was this period in the early 70s and to the, where I thought there was a real opening. And um, so, so that was encouraging. And that was a period in which, you know, my professor, Mr. George S. Rogan, He was elected uh, Distinguished Fellow of the American Economic Association. So on the basis really of his, of his past work in mathematical economics and statistical methods and so on. Uh, so, um, but that wouldn't happen again today. Uh, <laughs> so so that there was a period in which there was an open. And so my idea and those of many of the people I worked with colleagues was this uh, we don't need something new we can stay within the discipline of economics and redirect it and that's what we really wanted to do we didn't want to form a splinter group and, and be marginalized <laughs> we wanted to influence the mainstream and uh, so we tried uh, but the change that we wanted was just too big. Uh, the pill was too big for the mainstream to swallow. And so we were, we were marginalized and, and, and started our own journal, Ecological Economics, our, our own society, the International Society for Ecological Economics. It had to be international because there were too few people within, <laughs> within one nation. And uh, and that was um, and that was how how things sort of got started in that way. So um, there are many things I'm curious already about all of this. Why do you think? So it seemed that there was. You said there was an opening. Um, did you, do do you know why? It was there a closing as well. Did did you see like a, a creative moment where it was okay? We're gonna diverge and from now on the, 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 we can no longer influence mainstream but we need to build a body of science on our own uh, and compete with it somehow um i that's a good question i uh i guess what happened well i can tell you a story that doesn't really answer your question but i think it it indirectly it does um where I really realized the difference was when I worked for the World Bank and I went to the World Bank. It was later. It was 1988. And uh, I think it was in 92 that the World Bank, every year or so, the World Bank comes out with a World Development Report in which they study something and, and sort of give it out to all the countries, you know. Uh, well, this was the first time that they were ever going to tackle the subject of uh, environment and develop sustainable development. You know, this was the Brundtland Commission report made sustainable development de rigueur, and, and everybody had to do sustainable development, even though no one knew what it meant. And so, this was the World Bank's attempt to uh, to do that because the United Nations has sort of almost mandated it. Well, I was not on the team that wrote the report because I was in a different area. But 
I was on the uh, committee that reviewed the successive drafts of the report and made comments. So I, and this to me was the most important thing in, in the bank at the time. And so I was very eager to do it. And uh, the first draft landed on my desk and I eagerly read it and the first pages that came across a diagram and the title of the diagram was the relation of the economy to the environment. And uh, what was the diagram? It was a, rec a rectangle with an arrow coming in and the rectangle was labeled economy and the arrow coming in from the left labeled inputs and an arrow exiting to the right labeled outputs. And that was the picture of the relation of the, of the economy to the environment. And um, so I, I wrote some comments on that. I said, well, this is a good, this is a good beginning. We've got, a, we've got the economy, but there's no environment. You know, they, the inputs are coming from nowhere. The outputs are going nowhere. And uh, we need to view the economy as a subsystem of a larger system, the environment, the ecosystem, the biosphere. And uh, if we do that, then we could say, what are these inputs? These inputs uh, represent depletion, and that's a cost, and we have to consider it. The outputs represent the uh, uh, pollution. Outputs back to the environment represent pollution, and that's a cost, and we have to consider it. And then we have to talk about the possibilities of recycling waste outputs uh, to inputs. What are the limits of recycling? How far can we go in that direction? Um, and we have to look at um, the fundamental input to, uh, to the total environment, the biosphere, solar energy, the solar flux, and the exiting of the heat. Uh, what controls that balance? And how hot does the world have to get before, uh, before it reestablishes a, an, a, an equilibrium? And on and on like that. And, we, and so this, this is what we should really do. Well, later on, uh, the second revision comes through and I look at it and the second revision shows the same picture. Only this time the rectangle has a, a larger rectangle drawn around it, like a picture frame uh, with no label, no change <laughs> in the discussion, no change in the text. It was the, basically the same. They simply ignored you know, so I said the same thing over again, you know, in a slightly more emphatic way. And, uh, and then the third revision came across my desk. No more diagram. They had omitted the whole <laughs> idea of drawing a, a picture of the relation of the economy to the environment. It was too difficult. It was too difficult to swallow. It was too big a pill to swallow. Why? Because once you draw the economy as a subsystem of a larger system, well, the larger system is finite, non-growing, materially closed. You threaten yourself with questions to which you do not have a good answer. Namely, how big can the subsystem be relative to the total system? What limits it, you know, so forth. And how, how long can growth continue of the subsystem? Exactly what is growing? Well, the World Bank is devoted to growth. That's its reason to be. And so that was a question that could not be dealt with because, I mean, they're not stupid. They know the basic facts that I just outlined, but they're not stupid either about what the World Bank is for. <laughs> <laughs> and so there, there was just no way to, to do that. So I think somewhere along the line, that's what limped, that's what killed the, the progress. Uh, I mean, that kind of realization that, hey, this is really serious. Uh, if you can't grow forever or can't keep on growing, uh, how, what are we going to do about poverty? Oh, my God, we're going to have to redistribute and share. Uh, that's 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 politically impossible. What are we going to do about population growth? Oh, we're going to have to have a, po a policy of some sort. 
oh, well, that's impossible. Uh, what are we going to do? But well, uh, about um, about all the environmental destruction that we how are we going to re uh, um, fix the, the damage we've done to the environment? Well, we're going to have to lower consumption of resources, particularly fossil fuels. Well, that's the, so I think that just killed it at, at the intellectual political level. At, at a more personal level, I uh, was teaching at Louisiana State University. And I got along just fine there for 15 years. And, um, but over that time, towards the end, the, I was moving in one direction, you know, economics is a life science limit, so forth. And the rest of the department was moving in the opposite direction, more <laughs> neoclassical economics, because that's, that's what's valued by the profession. So the, the difference got so great that I could no longer really um, have a graduate student because you have to have five members of a committee approve a dissertation. <laughs> and, you know, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't put together that. And so it was, so I thought it was very unfair and, and I was unhappy with the way they treated some of my students. So that was when I uh, began to look around and, and shortly after that moved to the World Bank. Yeah, I can imagine, as you say, so perhaps at the very beginning, everybody was excited, at least with the analogy and how far we can go with this analogy and how creative we can, we can, or how we can be inspired by life sciences. And as soon as we got to the practicalities of things and to the policy making of things and to the politics of what it implies to say that economics are a life science and if we should therefore apply quotas and all of that, then everybody backed off <laughs> immediately saying, whoa, 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 perhaps this is way too much for us to, to understand and to put into practice. Yes, I, I think that's exactly it. And, uh, um, you know, and then there was the, I guess to put another, shine another light on it, it, it um, the World Bank wanted to fight poverty and, you know, so did I. And, uh, and this was saying, oh, you may, this is really going to be a lot harder. Uh, you're, what you're saying is going to make fighting poverty a lot harder. You know, are, are, you, are you against poor, are you in favor of keeping people poor? You know, <laughs> why don't you want growth? There, there must be something wrong, wrong with you. Uh, you're anti-human uh, and so forth. So that kind of thing came out too. And um, so, of course, you have this diagram at the at this article on economics as a life science, where you compare a living organism to economics with anabolism, catabolism, and then production and consumption with inputs and outputs. And of course, this is something that uh, me and my colleagues working on urban metabolism, linking mm -hmm. cities as living organisms, we have very similar diagrams and very similar analogies and of course over time so urban metabolism was was used by marx at the very beginning let's say or the, the metaphor of metabolism uh, then it was used by schools of sociologies it was used by abel woolman by many different people to mean different processes as well of, of cities and phenomena of cities and so i'm wondering at uh what did you find so appealing in this comparison between this life organism and the economy. I mean, you could say that it is a life system, but there is also an analogy to it. So I can. Im you, you said also the importance. What is the importance of analogies within science? How how did you see that, and wh why do you think was was it so important to to start making analogies? Yeah. Um, well, I don't know. I guess I've just always liked analogies. Uh, uh, in fact, some si some. Psychologists even consider uh, the ability to recognize analogies to be one of the criteria of intelligence. So, <laughs> I, yeah, that's You're nice. above average, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, well, it just seemed evident to me. Well, let's see, where shall I put it? 
Well, go back. To, go. Well, here you, you're very kind to invite me on this program and to talk about the uh, circular metabolism, and it's rather an ungracious of me to criticize the very concept of circular. Oh, please metabolism. do. Please but, do. But this is uh, this was something that I think is important because you know words matter, and uh, how how did we get started really? with ecological economics and, and well the first thing if you go back to the standard economics textbooks the neoclassical first chapter what do you get you've shown the circular flow diagram firms and households firms produce goods to, for households households consume the goods households supply factors of production to the firms and it goes around and around and around. And, and George S. Q. Rogan called it a, a circular merry-go-round. You know, nothing comes in from the outside. There's no need of resources. Nothing exits to the outside. There's no need for waste to absorb. It just goes around and around. Well, okay, I'm, you could say when that was, when that uh, neoclassical economics developed, the world was, the economy was very small relative to the biosphere. And so it made some sense to consider resources in the rest of the biosphere as basically infinite. I mean, resources were not scarce. Uh, waste absorption capacity was not scarce. Economics is really interested in scarcity, what's scarce and how to use it best. So, so abstracting from what was not scarce I and mean, that was defensible. Uh, I think it was wrong, but it was still defensible. Well, then you, when you have a period of growth, you know, uh, when something grows, it gets bigger, as Kenneth Boulding emphasized, <laughs> uh, and the economy got bigger. And, uh, you know, when I was born and back in 1938, I, the world population was, uh, I think it was 2 billion. And now it's right at eight, almost 8 billion. So the world population has quadrupled in my lifetime. You know, I don't think that's ever happened before in a single lifetime. And uh, I don't think it'll, it's likely to happen again. So hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> so you see, you see this tremendous, so now we we no longer live in an empty world. It wasn't only population, of course, that quadrupled. I mean, I mean, energy consumption even vastly more than quadrupled, and and consumption of all materials went up by enormous amounts. I don't have the numbers before me now, but 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 the point is, the world moved from relatively empty to relatively full, and what used to be the limiting factor in production namely capital and, la and labor. Well, we increased the population. We had a whole lot more la labor became not so limiting. Capital we accumulated became not so limiting. The flow of resources and the absorptive capacity of the environment became the limiting factors. But economics did not recognize that. I mean, we still kept on with the old Cobb Douglas production function. Production is a function of capital and labor. No resources involved at all. Uh, the measurement of, in GDP, uh, we kept on um, considering natural resources in situ in the ground as uh, of zero value. The, the only value we counted of natural resources was the labor and capital cost of extracting them. Uh, so with admirable consistency, both macro and mi microeconomics ignored nature and the natural envelope that contains the economy uh, was by implication, we continued to think of that as infinite and not scarce. And so that's, um, I, I think, was is the thing that we have to change, and and it is changing. People are, I mean, people are are not stupid. They're recognizing this, and we're we're paying the costs, and that bring, brings us 
But economics is still, and at the theoretical level in the textbooks, it's still very slow to bring that into the picture. And and so to to counter this omission of of nature, um, you proposed well, you you base your work a bit on Stuart Mill's work to to propose steady state economics, um, whereas you say it is a constant stock of people and physical wealth. Um, could you perhaps explain why you think this macroeconomic policy? would contain us in, in the, the dangers of overshooting, but also uh, serving societal needs simultaneously? Uh. Yeah, I, uh, I guess my first thought on that subject, which really occurred to me more, well, um, I saw the steady state I, I, in John Stuart Mill. I'd read John Stuart Mill as an undergraduate, And it just kind of went in one ear and out the other. I didn't. But then when I was in Northeast Brazil, I, I really saw the importance of the rapid growth of population at that time. Uh, it slowed down a lot since then. But at that time, it was, you know, over 3%. And, and there was real problems with distribution. And, and, the, uh, it, and it was the poor class that was having the large number of children, the rich class practiced contraception. So you had a differential fertility that was quite large, which meant that uh, you had a, a super abundant supply of labor at low wages and a great reinforcement to the, to the uh, capitalist system and the inequality in the distribution. Anyway, all of those things uh, occurred. And I said, well, So I said, look, I began to look at the demography, to think more about demography and to study demography. And naturally came very early across the demographer's model of a stationary population. And I said, well, this is, this is rather interesting, a stationary population, the way, the way they define it. Uh, and it had many, many, many nice features about it. Um, and then two things. I said, well, we have not only a population of human bodies, which are physical, but we have populations of extensions of human bodies, which are also physical, you know, well, uh, cars are, and bicycles are an extension of our legs. You know, this uh, computer is an extension of our brains and eyes and ears and so forth. But all these are physical things. And so they have Uh, birth rates, that is production rates, and they have death rates, uh, depre physical depreciation rates. So you have, once again, the biological and within skin and outside skin, you have what applies to the population of humans applies very much to the population of extensions of humans, the physical population. And so if you're going to have a steady state, If you're not going to grow forever and have a stay, so then you have to have birth rates equal to death rates. Uh, well, uh, you can have birth rates equal to death rates at a high level of births and deaths or at a low level of births and deaths. And it makes a big difference because if it's, <laughs> if it's at a low level of births and deaths, then you have long life expectancy. If it's at a high level, you have short life expectancy. Similar thing with uh, artifacts, commodities, wealth. If if you have a uh, if you have an equal production and depreciation rates at high levels, then you have short lifetimes and uh, durability and so forth. Um, Well, that's looking at it from the point of view of maintaining the stocks in a steady state. Uh, our economy based on GNP maximization, GNP is a flow. And so um, you want to maximize the flow uh, that is maximized production Uh, that sort of leads you into short life expectancy and, and other odd things. 
So I begin to worry about that. Anyway, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm rattling on here. I, let, let, me, uh, let me turn it back to you to straighten out the conversation here. No, no, I think, well, I wanted to, to understand, you know, also what, what was so appealing to you into the steady state economics, mm -hmm. because of course, it starts with stocks and flows, even if that is an economic process, it's also an ecological process. So mm -hmm. even if uh, th there were um, parallelism between life sciences and economics, it wasn't well formulated in these terms. So I was quite interested to yeah. to figure out, you know, you also mentioned that there is also these three factors that we should always consider in steady state uh, economics, but also in any type of economy, such as um, scale, distribution, and allocation. Um, and of course, this brings out not only a macroeconomic um, quota or how much we should consume, but also how well it is distributed and to whom. So I think what you bring here with uh, steady state economics is, and perhaps uh, also, John Stuart Mill also mentioned that back in the day, it's still an increase of well-being and an increase yeah. of the good life within some limits, of course, exactly. and also stay within the planetary boundaries. Yeah, exactly. That was a, kind of the big distinction between John Stuart Mill and the other classical economists who also thought of this of a steady state economy and the, uh, you know, um, Adam Smith and uh, David Ricardo and, and some others, they, they also thought that the steady state would be a natural result of the laws of uh, economics, uh, the law of diminishing returns, the, the iron law of wages, uh, the law of differential rent. You put all that together and, it, and the uh, landlord class unproductively absorbs the surplus and you stop growing and and your wages your working class goes down to subsistence wage and so it's, it looks like a pretty lousy world and they and they thought so they did not like the idea of a, of a uh, stationary state john stuart mill recognized the limits and he said well you know uh if we're not if we're not going to totally override nature and and every, uh, every wildflower plowed up as a weed in the name of improved agriculture, <laughs> then, then you have to um, come to terms with the idea of non-growth or steady state. And he, of course, made the, said that doesn't need to be bad because we redirect our energies away from all of this trampling and, on everything and growing, growing to qualitative improvement of life uh, to true development as opposed to uh, growth so that uh, qualitative improvement replaces quantitative increase as, as our mode of progress. And, and uh, he thought that would be a much better world. And that struck me as quite a reasonable, <laughs> a reasonable thing to uh, pursue. And I, I really enjoyed the, the moment where you discuss about distribution. Uh, so saying that we, we could have quotas or caps in terms of uh, both uh, depletion or pollution uh, quotas and, uh, and, and caps, let's say. And ideally, it should be the, the state that then distributes it to, to individuals or to private uh, companies, um, which I don't, I, I don't know whether they... It, it would ever be a good idea that it is private people having these quotas and then selling them to, to other people. So I think there is the only reasonable way is still to, to have it being owned by the public. But then I wanted also to, yeah. to ask you, is there an interesting link that we could do linking depletion and pollution together? Because often we, we can put a price into depletion quotas because mm -hmm. we, we know how much is available yeah. more or less, but for pollution ones, uh, well, you know, it's especially for atmospheric pollution. Yeah. Well, now with the 1.5 degrees and how much carbon we have left, we could mm -hmm. have a price there, but you know, would it be interesting to systemically join 
pollution and depletion simultaneously. Absolutely. And this is what, uh, I think this is a big difference between ecological economics with the concept that Bolding introduced a long time ago, throughput, which is basically metabolism again, you know, you, the, the, the food, the digestion and the waste, uh, the throughput flow. Uh, so that, can, that physically connects depletion with pollution. So that if you, if you limit depletion, then in a gross aggregate sense, you're also limiting pollution. And if you limit pollution, then in a gross sense, you're also limiting depletion. Of course, there's plenty of room for qualitative difference. One doesn't perfectly control the other. But, uh, and a corollary of that, I believe, is that uh, for policy purposes, sometimes it's easier to try to limit depletion and sometimes it's easier to limit pollution in general i think it's easier to limit depletion because depletion is more concentrated there are fewer mines and wells mm -hmm. than there are smokestacks and garbage cans so it's just physically easier and it's the point of lower entropy in in the flow so it's easier um so that's that's one thing. Now, there was something else I wanted to add to that. What was it? That's one of the problems of getting old that you forget what you're going to say. Um, oh, um, well, I guess earlier you, you talked about uh, the scale distribution and allocation. That um, just to tie that in, scale I originally defined in terms of the stocks of people and artifacts and capital following the classical economists. You could also find scale, you could say uh, that uh, scale is defined in terms of the flows, the throughput flow necessary, or no, the, the flu, throughput flow that the environment can support uh, but on the, both the depletion and the pollution side. What is the maximum, let's say, or optimal throughput? And then the stocks grow to whatever level can be supported by permitted, that throughput. Yeah. That is probably a more operational definition, I think, than, than constant stocks because uh, flows are easier to measure than stocks. And I think it's, uh, and, and it's the flows that directly influence the environment. So I, I think uh, that that's what should be done. Also, I've come uh, over the years, or actually from rather early on, and then I backed away from it. The, uh, the idea that that you should limit quantity rather than try to try to fix quantity rather than price. I mean, the ecosystem doesn't care about prices. It cares <laughs> about quantities. And so if you fix the quantity, then that's ecologically safer. Now there's going to be errors and omissions. If you fix the quantity, then given a demand curve, you're also going to fix the price, but the demand curve shifts around all the time. So there are going to be errors and omissions uh, from estimating demand. Well, let the errors and omissions work themselves out in price changes mm -hmm. because that doesn't really affect it, the biosphere, whereas quantity changes do. So fixing and, and furthermore, I think it's much safer to fix quantities and let let a kind of market system determine the price. Because if you go directly with the price and to increase efficiency, then you also get the Jevons paradox where resulting increases in efficiency from higher prices may cause increased use of the resource rather than lesser use. So for those reasons, I, I think we should go in the direction of 
Uh, and that's why I like cap auction trade system better than um, tax, uh, severance taxes or carbon tax. I, I've sort of waffled on that back and forth because I do recognize that uh, people say, well, you know, the severance, the, the uh, uh, tax on carbon is much easier than the, than the uh, auction cap auction trade system. Uh, all you have to do is, is uh, change the algebraic sign of the uh, depletion quotas <laughs> and, and you're there. Um, okay, I, I, that's a good argument. I, I accept the weight of that. And, and so maybe it's, maybe it's a necessary intermediate step to go first for price control, uh, fixing price and trying to control quantity by limiting the price. Um, but uh, ultimately, I don't think that's going to work because uh, you've got a whole monetary system that can counteract the, the price. You, you put a price on carbon, you make carbon more expensive, and then the Fed turns around through quantitative easing and finances the very tax increase that you, you've labeled. I mean, that could happen. So, um, so that, that's an area where there's a lot of room for debate and discussion and uh, an experiment, I think. But, I, there but is... I do favor, I do, I do favor the quantity limit. Yeah. Well, as you say, ecosystems do not have price, let's say, uh, um, are, are not basing anything on price. But uh, there is in steady state economics, and perhaps this has changed over the over the years, uh, you have the, the second half of, of of the of this whole um, let's say I don't know if it's a theory or an analogy works on population um, okay. and while as we've said I think population is now stabilizing we don't know at what it's going to stabilize if it's going to be ten billions yeah. uh, less or more uh, but let's say it's it's getting more stable. We're not going to see the same type of increase we saw over the last century. And so I'm wondering, um, or I can imagine back in the day and perhaps still today, this might be a more polarizing uh, yeah. parts of, uh, of the steady state economics. Uh, I'm wonder, I, I wonder how do, you, how do you respond to critiques or how did you, um, I can imagine when you were in North, Northern Western Brazil, you saw elements that were in favor of population, well, not, or, you know, birth control or, um, or um, you know, limiting, uh, let's say, uh, giving a birth, uh, preser um, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how we call them in, in English, but uh, uh, contraception pills and all yeah. of that. Um, do you still see, and you also mentioned that Kenneth Boulding had a, another way to to propose of limiting um, population more rich, redistributive in such. How do you see that in in the in contemporary times uh, this issue of uh, population? Yeah, uh, you're quite right to raise that. It's uh, it is a a difficult and um, controversial area. It's also an area where the environment, the whole environmental movement has changed uh, because it started one of the very first things in, in the, I guess, 1970 or late 60s uh, was um, a zero population growth as a movement. And um, so, so the early environmental movement put principal emphasis on population growth. And then, then it dropped out. It said, no, uh, they were criticized by that. They were con told that they were, uh, you know, anti-human anti and so forth. And also, of course, it's very difficult. How, there are difficult problems, you know, how do you, how do, you do it? What's what's the way, and um, and then and then the immigration question came along. Well, population can grow either by uh, births greater than deaths or by in migrants greater than out migrants, 
And so the, uh, the United States, uh, at least, it considers itself a, a nation of immigrants. We can come back to that, exactly what that means or should mean. And, uh, and that this was very much opposed to the whole history of the United States and our progress and our values of being welcoming. And so all of that uh, really put the damper on any consideration of population. And of course, then a more reasonable, in my opinion, notion was that, hey, we've got the demographic transition as a, as a, a sociological phenomenon. When people uh, get richer, they tend to have fewer children. I mean, there's a substitution effect going on here. Uh, people substitute cars and refrigerators for children. As, as they get richer and that increases their standard of living. And uh, that's what standard of living really means is, is more cars and refrigerators. And that sort of goes along with fewer children because you have to get the money from somewhere. Okay, those, um, I think that's kind of what happened and what pushed. And then there was, well, ca encapsulated in the slogan, which was, was heard, uh, um, development is the best contraceptive. You know, it's just don't think, don't think about population. Think only about increase and you'll get, you'll get population control as a bonus. You don't have to deal with it directly. Well, this, is, this was the idea and it's still, I think, very much part, part of the degrowth movement. They, they don't want to talk about it at all. And uh, particularly the immigration side. I think that's gonna change. You can take that as a prediction, but it hasn't changed yet. Um, okay, I'm rattling on because this is, this is a difficult uh, area. Um, the bolding plan. <laughs> now that was, that's an interesting thing. I was interested in that, both from the point of view of population, bolding, realized it very soon after he had said it, I think, that this was, uh, this was a non-starter politically. It wasn't going to go anywhere in terms of a, of a way of controlling population. People just reacted very badly towards it, even those who, who favored some form of population limitation. Interestingly, at the same time, I mean, just, just Think for a minute about the logic of the control program. He was asking the question, how do you, um, if, populate, if the society wants to limit its population growth, its size, or if you want to reduce the population like China was trying to do, what's the best way to do it? How can you do it in a way that you really control aggregate births with an equality in the right to reproduce in an efficient way that re reflects individual. Uh, and so Bowling said, well, you know, in his logical sort of mind, thinking, well, one way you could do it, you could figure out what is, what is the number of births that gives you uh, population stability, given the death rate, whatever the death rate structure is, uh, how many births per, well, 2.1 is you know, sort of what it'll be. Okay, so you give every, every couple, every woman, because women are the limiting factor, uh, that many rights to reproduce. So you've distributed equally this new asset, uh, right to reproduce. You've treated everyone equally in terms of distribution, but people are not equal in terms of their desire to have children or their ability to have children. So you've allowed, you then allow for people who cannot have children or don't want to have children to give or sell or exchange their right to reproduce with someone else who wants to have more, yeah? So you respect allocative efficiency 
at the same time that you have focus first on distributive equity, distributive equity. So in a way it goes right back to this uh, scale distribution allocation. First, you set the scale. What's the number of population? Well, it's 2.1 children per person will give you a constant population at, at, at the level, let's say you want. So you fix the scale first. Then you say, well, who, who owns this right? Well, we'll distribute it equally. Everybody who can use the right owns the same amount. And then, so that takes care of distribution, equity of this. And then the third, efficiency of allocation, you recognize the differences in desires and, and ability to have children and allow reallocation of the distributed rights in that way. Okay, that's exactly the logic behind the cap auction trade system, which is applied to commodities or, or resources rather than to birth licenses. So it, to me, it was very interesting that Boulding's logic uh, <laughs> applied very excellently, I think, to uh, to the questions of, of uh, resource limitation. Uh, and it would apply to population limitation if people accepted it and wanted it. Well, people don't want it. They're not ready for it. It's not part of the culture. That It's very risque to to kind of propose that. I can imagine that yeah, it already is. back in the day. But, you know, then you say, but you look at China, for example, you know, China, Uh, they they decided that for a while at least they backed off from it now, but that they wanted to really seriously limit the population. So they went to a one child system, one child. That means you don't have any brothers or sisters. You don't have any uncles, aunts, or cousins. That's a massive social change, and. Uh, And I would think something like bolding system was, would, would not be nearly so drastic in terms of its, um, but people, people have a real antipathy towards any connection between a market and reproduction. Uh, they don't, well, they, they, they look at it as buying and selling children, you know, <laughs> as opposed to, you know, buying and selling a legal right to reproduce. And so that's, uh, that really puts a, a block on it. Now, as I, it's, I mean, there are a lot of things I don't understand. And here's, here's another one, which is um, given the, the large antipathy towards anything like a connection between markets and and reproduction implicit in Bolding's plan. Look at what's actually happening in the world right now, at least in my country. You have young women from elite colleges uh, selling OVA on the market, young men selling sperm for money. You have doctors combining the sperm and the ovum for a fee in vitro, implanting it into the rented womb of a surrogate mother to carry out the gestation of the child. Now, that is a far more drastic imposition of the market and prices into reproduction than building. So, You tell me, I mean, what's going on here? I, I don't, uh, I have trouble uh, putting the two things together. In practical terms for the time being, I think it makes sense uh, pragmatically to say, no, one should not push something like the bolding plan on reproduction because for right now, at least, things are moving in the right direction. Increase increased education of, of women and development is lowering the birth rate. 
okay, let's let's let that happen, uh, and let's stick with uh, the neo the neo Malthusian view, which is contraception. I mean, uh, you know, Malthus Malthus was against contraception as a uh, as a preacher in the Anglican Church. Uh, uh, and he, he said uh, you have late marriage. That's the way to control pot. Late marriage and continence outside of marriage. Well, the neo-Malthusians, Francis Place and others came along and said, no, no, that's never going to work. Uh, what you want is early marriage and contraception within marriage. And so that, that debate still continues today. Uh, indeed, I, I must say, I can't help it. You know, I, I come from <laughs> Texas, which is right on the, on the border with Mexico. In Texas right now, um, abortion is being outlawed, even though it's constitutionally guaranteed within the United States. And the um, contraception, the Planned Parenthood, which mainly pushes contraception, and abortion, only abortion as a, as a backup if necessary. They're trying to defund Planned Parenthood in the state of Texas, my, my home state. Across the border in Mexico, which traditionally was much more uh, Catholic and pro-natalist, they, uh, um, they just accepted legalization of abortion. So, I mean, the world changes in ways which I cannot predict at all, and uh, so I have to be I have to be a little. Uh, well, let's let's just wait and see what happens. I don't know what's <laughs> going to work out on that. Uh, the other thing I guess I could say is that it is possible to to reduce population growth. I mean, China proved that they were willing to pay the price. Japan also proved it without any drastic Im imposition from the top. After World War II, Japan lowered its population, its birth rate uh, by just social pressure. Just, uh, it was just, I mean, nobody decreed it, but it was just decided socially, collectively somehow that you don't have more than two children. And the, and the pressure was very great uh, socially. So anyway, I don't I don't know what's going to happen on that. Yeah, I, I can imagine this is such a thorny topic, and I think for most of people within the degrowth movement or in many other movements, the it's a matter of prior making priorities, uh, and as you said, with the current uh, way things are working out, it seems that first we should work on equity in terms of resource use uh, or affluence, and then only ever consider population as, as a topic to, to act upon. Because today, you know, we, we really, there is just a, a slow per a percentage of people that are damaging or over consuming the planet or some companies. And you know we would be far more efficient when you said as well beforehand on the depletion quotas to act upon a small amount of people rather than the entire population on population. I guess as the world stands today in terms of priority, that that seems to be far more efficient. I would say. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I certainly agree with you that that we would uh, we have to work on well, certainly in the United States, for example. The problem is uh, much more one of overconsumption than of overpopulation. So the, that's what we need to tackle first. Um, if and, uh, and also you, the countries that have, let's say, a population development are the ones that are consuming the less. So you know, there's a a very imbalanced question. Whereas, you know, steady state economics, if we were to apply steady state economics per country, let's say, yeah, I w it would be very interesting to see how, you know, this, this physical uh, stocks 
uh, both uh, in terms of uh, you know uh, physicals in terms of uh, resources but also in of population how the the imbalance happens uh, within the planet and uh, well within a national economy rather than at a global economy yes uh I've I've never had the courage to think uh, <laughs> of a global uh, steady state system. I've only thought of it in in a national in national terms, and with the hope that uh, if it if you can make it work in in a nation, then that can be copied and eventually become uh, global, it, global in the sense of all all nations independently moving towards their own system of, uh, of maintaining population as opposed to a, of a world government trying to control world population. That, that I see as um, a chimera. <laughs> but I, um, the other thing I suppose I would still say that one one should think about population not only from the point of view of the desire of parents to have children being fulfilled, but also from the point of view of the welfare of the child being born. You know, I think most of us would say, well, you know, it's uh, although the rich are messing up the world, uh, from the point of view of the child, it's sort of better to be born rich than to be born poor. And if you're going to be born poor, uh, maybe fewer fewer births to the poor uh, might have some. You might say something in favor of that. Not only for the point of view of the child, which I think is very important, but I think there are very few parents anywhere who have already had three or four children and are poor who actually want more. And so this, I think we should really uh, focus very much on the Planned Parenthood contraception, you know, movement. I mean, put aside Bolding's plan for a while. Let's just talk about uh, purely voluntary uh, contraception for, uh, with the consequence of lowering population where people actually want fewer births, which think is quite prevalent in many parts of the world. Yeah, of course, the choice is not always there in many contexts. That's the whole difficulty in the situation. Well, in that, any is, case, I, that yeah. is what I saw in Northeast Brazil, mm -hmm. which I, I'll just go back for just a second there. Uh, there's the, the lower class at the time, I emphasize this was in the 1960s. It's much different now although there's still a big difference in terms of class uh, fertility. The, uh, the lower class was having on average like eight children. Uh, the upper class on average, maybe four. Okay, so this meant that it was hard to see how wages were ever going to rise with this kind of situation. And in fact, you go back to Marx, uh, well, you know, in uh, I guess in the, the word proletariat as used by Marx, proletariat, Marx, by, for Marx it meant the working class, non-owners non of the means of production who must sell their labor power to the capitalist in order to live. You go back before Marx into Latin, uh, pro, proletariado comes from pro, proli, which means children. So the proletariat was the class that was useful to the Roman Republic for the purpose of having children to do the dirty work. Yeah. And the upper class, the patricians, they, you know, they practice contraception or whatever, but the patro, but you couldn't. That wouldn't work for well. I saw I saw remnants of that in Northeast Brazil, in the sense that, you know, who who were the there were some people who were in favor. Well, let me back up. The only population control that was being recommended by anyone was voluntary family planning, 
through the uh, Benestar Familiar group in, in, at that time in, in Brazil, who was opposing Benestar Familiar, which was just voluntary family planning. Well, there was the Catholic Church, which was rather split on the subject, but officially they, they were against um, uh, contraception. There was the oligarchy, which had an interest in cheap labor. You know, there, it doesn't do for foxes to advocate small families for rabbits. You know, you, you want to keep, uh, keep who you're exploiting. And then there was a, a kind of collectivist nationalist uh, ethos, which is more understandable. Uh, that country is greatest, which has the most people. And in particular in Brazil, with the settling of the Amazon, Brazil has always felt that this was, this was very vulnerable to being taken over because of its underpopulated area that people from the rest of the world would take over the Amazon. And indeed there were proposals that the state of Israel should be uh, formed in the Amazon. Um, well, that didn't fly, but other people, people have made all sorts of proposals for sort of the Am using the Amazon as if it were uh, common property for the world to decide how to use. And the Brazilians don't like that a bit. And so they wanted to populate it. And, uh, and so that was part of the reason. Well, I'm, I'm, I've talked too much about that. So let me just back. Let me just uh, turn it over to you to follow in other ways. No, no. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we, we, we always go back to this discussion. And so there is not a, I don't know how to answer it. That's why I was curious to know how you've been responding to it over the years. I want to um, to perhaps continue with this uh, element because you mentioned how back in the 70s population was a, was a hot topic with uh, also one of the persons that contributed to, to the book Towards the State Economy, uh, Paul Ehrlich, with the population bomb and all of that. And I, I'm wondering how this book perhaps forged your um, interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity because you had so many experts coming from different fields. Uh, and, well, you, of course, said that you always were curious from different disciplines and you always wanted to bring them together, perhaps to make sense for economy. So I'm wondering how, you know, how the, the birth of ecological economics came about, this interdisciplinary slash sometimes transdisciplinary field that that really looks at the interdependence between human economy and ecosystems. Uh, how did how did this was it through discussions? How did this uh, you decided to to work on this and to develop this uh, journal and then society as well? Yeah. Um, well, that's a good question. Because that book that you meant, that anthology, which includes all of those, I used that. That was uh, my basic teaching uh, document. <laughs> I used that in teaching. And uh, the way that came about, to my mind, what, what motivated me was a kind of a vision, which somehow I had picked up partly from well, from interest in ethics and religion and also interest in science um, was what I, I think in the book, in the book, in the introduction, there's something called the ends mean spectrum, which I start out at the top. Well, it starts, I started with ultimate means. What, you know, what is, what is that which is good which does not derive its goodness from being instrumental to some other good, which is sort of the maximum good. Things serve it, it doesn't. It is that which is being served. Uh, that's the criterion by which, you by which you decide whether a hierarchy of other good things, you know, ethics is sort of putting good things in order. What comes first, what comes second, what comes third, 
uh, well, some, that something has to go in first place, you know, if you have priorities. <laughs> and so that's, the, that's sort of the vision of the ultimate end. We can only see that dimly, but we can't come up with a ethical ordering of intermediate ends unless we have some perception, however vague, of a more ultimate end that they're serving. So I think that's the problem of ethics. So I'll put that at the top of the ends of me. That's what the service. Then on that basis, you get a ranking of intermediate ends, good things which you want to serve, which economics, and then in the middle, then you have, uh, then let's go down to the bottom. What about what about means? What, what is it that's going to serve that end? What's What's the ultimate means? What do you need to satisfy any end in human life? What is that which we use up in order to satisfy our ends, but cannot ourselves create? What do we take as given and, and have to use up to satisfy? Well, it's low entropy matter energy. It's the laws of thermodynamics at the base of, of the thing. So the big question then, I mean, to look at it in a huge way is how do you use the low entry matter energy ultimate means so as best to serve the ultimate end in the spectrum? Well, that's such a huge question. Nobody, we, we can't think about it. So you break it up into parts. You use the low entropy matter energy, you convert that into intermediate means, into, into machines and commodities and things that serve your ends. So you have technology as the conversion of low entropy matter energy, ultimate means into intermediate means that can directly serve our needs. Uh, so we then the application of the relationship between those uh, intermediate means and our intermediate ends is I call political economy. That's where economics comes in, allocation, distribution scale. And then at the ultimate ultimate end, the question of ranking our hierarchies of intermediate ends. Which intermediate ends do you emphasize first? That's the question of ethics and so Okay, that vision then of that ends means spectrum was the organizational principle of that anthology. Uh, because one section dealt with the, the means and the uh, ultimate ultimate means and then you know and then another section with the ultimate end insofar as people can say much about it and then the other was economics so that was the that was the attempt to pull that together um you know uh of course it was it was not i mean it was not a complete neat separation into the three parts, there were some overlaps and some things that maybe didn't fit as well as they should have. But uh, that, that was the idea behind that. And of course, making it an anthology, I was not capable of dealing with such a big, a big topic all by myself. And so that was why I, I really wanted an anthology and I would really wanted to choose people who I think had had made contributions in that area, and that was that was uh, that was what went on in there. And I used that for a long time at teaching, and students seemed to like it. And how did that translate into the journal or the field of ecological economics? What was was it step by step, or how was it a happy accident, or what were the <laughs> behind the curtains? Uh, well, you know, I guess it was partly uh, what was going on is I was not, of course, the only person thinking along these lines. In that way, there were many other people who had, um, you know, you mentioned earlier, who had been dissatisfied with 
the way economics was going and wanted to bring in ethics or technical matters and and uh, and particularly ecology. So uh, I guess one very fortuitous thing while I was at LSU, this was what the uh, they have a, a coastal studies institute which has um, some ecologists and and they just and they hired uh, a, a young energy ecologist Robert Costanza came to LSU and uh, Bob Costanza had been a student of H T Odom in, in the energy school. And there was another ecologist there, uh, John Day, who had also been a student of Odom, who was at LSU. And these, and, and uh, so we formed a little group, which uh, saw, saw the importance of bringing ecology and economics together, you know, and because you could, ecologists had sort of long been kind of playing the game of let's pretend man doesn't exist and look at the <laughs> ecosystem and how it behaves by itself. And economists had been playing the game, let's pretend that nature doesn't exist and just look at man. And we we just, all, all of us and many other people, I guess, you know, came to the conclusion this was not the right way to do it. And we needed to bring these two together. Uh, he, um, and so we started that. And in particular, uh, Costanza uh, and I said, well, we need a society and a journal. And, uh, and we found uh, a like-minded person in uh, Juan Martinez Salier in Spain who had independently been thinking in, in this for a long time. And, uh, and Bob had contacts with Sweden, uh, Anne-Marie Anne -Marie Janssen and Bengt Uy Janssen and others in Sweden. And so that uh, Bob and so that little group really was the nucleus which began to form the journal Ecological Economics and um, and, and the society. <clears throat> and as I said before, it had to be international because there were so few of us in each, <laughs> each nation. And then later on, we, uh, as it grew, then there began to develop national sub units, you know, so you had the European or the European, the U US, the Canadian, the Brazilian, and, and so that's been a, a development from there. Um, and we were very, very fortunate, I must say, because uh, I think I, one really has to give a whole lot of credit to Bob Costanza for not only his, his intellect, but uh, his energy, his entrepreneurial energy in, in putting these kind of things together. and. Uh, um, and so that, I think it, and then there were a whole lot of other people who came in and, and over the years, uh, contributed to, to this. And again, going back the other way, of course, there was a tremendous, we all, uh, drew from the writings of, uh, Kenneth Boulding, George Eskew Rogan, and I, and also from Galbraith, John Kenneth Galbraith, mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier. And uh, and H. T. Odom and the energy the energy theorists so all of that kind of came together and we said this makes a whole lot more sense than neoclassical economics and um, and and by that time we had sort of realized that we were not going to have a great influence on neoclassical economics itself so we we're going to go in a separate way. Um, I asked around, um, asking what were some questions, some good questions I should ask you uh, from the ecological economics uh, movement, but also from other people that, uh, that mm -hmm. we discuss. And uh, I received a question from uh, Julia Steinberger. She's an ecological economist yeah. herself. Sure. Uh, and she said, 
Um, what is perhaps your proudest moments in terms of kickstarting ecological economics as a field? What you regret and perhaps what you have done differently in hindsight? <laughs> uh, well, um, I think if, if, well, we've already talked about the, the concept of economics as a life science and the uh, allocation, distribution, and scale question and um, things like that. And um, well, in a way, although I was totally unsuccessful, I'm sort of proud of, of making the effort for six years to influence the World Bank. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it, we really uh, need to not just preach to the choir, but try to, to uh, deal with the world. And, and I must say that within the World Bank, there were some excellent people. I mean, my uh, mentor and colleague there, Robert, the late Robert Goodland, uh, I think accomplished a number of things in the in the environmental direction within the bank, but as far as I can tell, those have not survived. Uh, maybe they will be revived, and maybe the things are leading the bank. Uh, but it, basically, the six years I spent there, I thought we were making progress for a while, and there were some things I was proud of, um, but it, it didn't really work out uh what were the other questions what, uh, the other so questions? what were you proud of what you would regret in developing oh. this community and perhaps what you have done what you would have done differently in hindsight yeah i guess um in terms of the name well we've already talked about that i won't go <laughs> i suppose um you know one thing I, I suppose I regret, but not entirely, <laughs> is that, um, you know, when you disagree, I, I've noticed this, I, I had a student uh, who uh, had a remarkable capacity for disagreeing without getting mad. And he would be you know, just, just the nicest person and, but totally in disagreement on something, but not the least bit angry. Now, I have never been able to do that. When I, when I have a fundamental disagreement, <laughs> my temperature rises, <laughs> I, tend to, I tend to get angry. And that's, that's a defect. Uh, I suppose that's a character defect. But if I could, um, if I could, you know, uh, figure out a way to uh, to have been a little less abrasive and not gotten so angry in some discussions, uh, I, I would do that. On the other hand, <laughs> I'm not sorry. I, I mean, you do have to push, be a little pushy sometimes because, uh, well, for example, take George S. Rogan, his critique of production and the production function, particularly of, of Robert Solo and Stiglitz and so forth, he made that a, a very reasoned uh, critique. They simply ignored it. They just did not reply. They ignored it for 20 years, 20 years. And and so I, uh, I did get mad about that. And I did, you know, sort of instigate, uh, try, you know, become rather aggress aggressive and say, look here, you know, you, you really deserve to, you really have an obligation to make some effort to answer this. And so, I mean, that's, that debate's still going on. I mean, people <laughs> are still discussing that now, but, um, but I guess if I could have just, uh, I think it's a very great personal quality to be able to disagree strongly because we have very big 
issues of difference in the world uh, without getting angry. And uh, I'm, I'm still trying to improve on that regard. And um, yeah, sorry, go on. Uh, and I, uh, well, you were going to ask some other questions, so let me let me back off and let you bring. No, I was just I was just wondering. Um, well, she, the, the last bit of her question was as well. What do you think is the most important now? And you also, uh, in the, the the chapter that you sent me, gave me a uh, how steady state economics is positioned with some current uh, policies. Uh, one bottom up, which would be degrowth, and mo uh, one more top down that might be circular economy. So I'm wondering, in all of this complexity, how, if you had to pinpoint some elements to move forward, what do you think is the most important oh, topic yeah. or subject to to move forward? Right well, now? these are these things. You take steady state economics. You take circular economy, degrowth. I guess the donut economics, and all these things have a have sort of a common insight, and I, we all ought to really be working together, and uh, and so, in particular, you know, there's the uh, the uh, um, degrowth and the steady state. I like uh, Brian Check. Uh, he he suggested a. Uh, well, well, let's just take the slogan, uh, degrowth to a steady state, you know, because the degrowth people, they don't believe in degrowth forever. They're not stupid. Uh, and the steady state, we're not advocating steady state at an, at an excessive current level that can't possibly be maintained. We're not stupid either. And so, you know, I think we, we should... Uh, you know, come together, recognize whatever differences. I think there's a complementarity there because the degrowth is more of a theoretical policy orientation starting from classical economics and, and, and dealing with the problems of growth on the ground. Whereas, the, as I understand it, the degrowth movement is more of a grassroots movement that started out from the real problems of growth and and is uh, sort of working its way up to an understanding of uh, of theory and policy. Uh, so you know there's there's lots of room for collaboration and uh, and so I hope that happens. That's one of my hopes. Um, uh, and in the meantime, we have to you know, argue with each other about terminology and things, you know, like I, I don't like circular because <laughs> the economy is really not circular. And so I'm just going to be stubborn about that. But while recognizing that people who use that term, you know, they, they advocate a lot of very good policy that I agree with. So. Yeah. If they're not circular for the right, for, uh purpose or a goal as well it's not uh, as if it's going to help i mean mm -hmm. it's agnostic to growth sometimes uh, circular economy so that doesn't help with the yeah. cause to be honest right. right right um so herman i i've already took a lot of time uh of you i'd like to to finish with two questions i generally ask which is do you have any project for the end of this year in terms of writing in terms of reading something that you want to work on for, for this uh, uh, for this end of the year? And perhaps do you have any good books or, or movies or articles that you would like to suggest? Oh, well, um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm retired <laughs> and uh, I do try to sometimes write some more. I do keep, you know, occasionally writing little things. I don't have any big projects because my my life expectancy is is not that long. But um, uh, and I must confess to you that very often I write something. I work I work on something. I write it, and then I go back and read something that I wrote 
20 years ago <laughs> on the same topic. And I, I think, gee, what I said 20 years ago <laughs> is better. <laughs> so maybe it's time for me not to, uh, not, not to, to do that. As for books. Yeah. Just, uh, I'm happy to say there's a, I don't know if you can see this. Uh, Economie stationnaire. Economie in, in stationnaire French. in French. Yeah, French translation of my <laughs> 2014 book, which I was very pleased to, to see. And the thing I'll mention uh, that I've, it's not my work, it, it's partly, it's reflecting me, but uh, I don't know if you can see. Let me see that. Ah, yes. His life and ideas. Yeah. I couldn't. It's, uh, the uh, Herman Daly's Economics for a Full World, His Life and Ideas, by Peter Victor. Uh, so it's a kind of a biography. It is a biography, but it's mainly focusing on ideas and development of ideas and things rather than personal foibles and Uh, and things of that nature. So I think uh, he's Peter has done a very nice job of taking a number of trees that I and others have tried to plant and putting them together in a forest in, to, in a way that makes more sense. And Peter Victor is a, just, you know, is a very excellent uh, Canadian ecological economist and has made many contributions. So I'm Um, those are the two things that I'll mention. Um, have I seen any, any good movies or things? Well, I, you know, uh, on TV, I watch the, the David Attenborough series on the, uh, you know, for a long time, David Attenborough just showed pretty animals and <laughs> didn't worry about didn't seem to be too worried, but, but, you know, now he's become very worried and, and he, all of the beauty of nature that he loves and has presented for so long, he's really quite worried about it. And he not only, uh, you know, talks about the, the economic problems, but uh, also includes population, human population, uh, because, uh, well, just one more point on that, contested subject. I recently uh, saw some interesting figures. You know, the I can't remember now the exact numbers, but the um, got this from uh, um, the biomass of, of ver total biomass of vertebrates in the world something like 90%, over 90% now is human biomass plus the biomass of cattle and pigs and chickens that we immediately turn into our own biomass very quickly. So this is real anthropocentrism, this concentration of pulling together all some such a large percentage of the biomass of all vertebrates, you know, into just the human sphere. So I think we're, we're faced with, uh, again, the population question. We're going to have to, in some way, uh, reduce the physical size of the human niche w within the overall ecosystem. And that will be a very difficult thing to do. And, and uh, you know, I hope we hope we're able to. One other thing I'll say uh, that I that's impressed me very much recently was uh, Pope Francis' uh, encyclical Laudato Si. Uh, I thought that was really quite good. Of course, he omitted population <laughs> issues, but everything else about it I thought was really wonderful. And uh, so I, I thought that was very good. Well, thank you so much for taking so much time to have this conversation with me, to get some insights and behind the scenes of all of your work and all of the collaborators that you managed to have over those years. So 
Thanks so much, for Herman, for all of your time. Well, thank you, RC. I, I really appreciate your good questions. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, to listening until the end. We'll see you on the next episode, continuing discussing about these complex topics. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you soon.